What is the cost of the UK monarchy? I'm Christy Platson in Berlin. Thank you for joining. In countries aligned with the British Commonwealth, many have been mourning the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Her 70 years on the throne make her Britain's longest reigning monarch. The loss has the UK grappling with the question of the relevancy of the royal family and the cost of maintaining the monarchy. Well, to help us get an idea of the economic costs and benefits of the British monarchy, I am joined today by my two guests. We have Nikhil Kumar. He is deputy global editor at GRID, a news publication reporting on global affairs. Uh, he's written about the Queen's death in the context of the UK economy today. And we're also joined uh, by DW's UK correspondent, my colleague Bigot Moss, in London. Thank you both for joining me today. I'd like to start off in London, where Bigot is. Uh, we've seen a huge outpouring of grief, of support for the royal family in the days following the Queen's death. Also, a huge amount of pageantry involved in this day-long days -long affair. Bigot, what sort of price tag is on a funeral like this? And could you put that in context for us a little bit? Yes, I have tried to look into it. And there are no official figures. There are estimates. And the estimates are that it's about 8 um, million pounds. So that would be about the equivalent of 9 million euros. This is what other funerals, state funerals, in the past would have cost in today's money. However, this is not it. That would just be the actual staging of the event. On top of that, we have costs for security. We have costs for staff. Uh, we have volunteer organizations. 600 volunteers are from uh, the ambulance, from one ambulance organization alone. So, and, and then the Foreign Office, they have said that they have put 300 staff just for organizing the whole diplomacy uh, around the funeral. So that's man hours, basically, plus police. They, obviously, they have, they're, they are there in their tens of thousands, and they will lose um, working hours. On top of that, you also have the fact that the Monday, the day of the state funeral, is going to be a bank holiday. So the UK will also be losing productivity. So all in all, it's really not a small price tag. Yeah, it doesn't sound like that at all. I mean, you're just mentioning thousands of people working it, uh, many, many more thousands attending. Uh, Nikhil, I'd like to throw a question to you now. We've seen that the queue to view the coffin has been stretching for miles today, people camping out on the street. Talk to me, economically speaking, what is life for these people, for these regular people in the UK like right now? Well, it's getting harder. Um, you know, when when the Queen passed away, she she went off the stage, so to speak, at, at a very, very important um, and a very dark crossroads for Britain. It is facing, like so many other countries around the world, certainly in Europe, very, very high rates of inflation, a lot of it fanned by the war in Ukraine. Energy prices are high. The first thing, the, the last constitutional duty that Queen Elizabeth II fulfilled before she passed away, it was appointed new Prime Minister Liz Truss, whose first act when she became Prime Minister was to announce a massive package to try and shield ordinary Britons from the impact of these high energy bills. And, you know, so, and that pressure will only most likely intensify as we enter the winter months. You know this really well where you are in Germany, where there's been historically a lot of high dependence on energy coming in from Russia. Britain doesn't have the same direct dependence, but it is, of course, affected by the price rises on the international market. There's that. This is also, of course, again, like other countries around the world, a country which is still recovering from and readjusting to the world post-COVID. So all of these upheavals, and of course, I haven't mentioned one thing yet, which is Brexit, right? That is still something the real effects of which are only just beginning to be felt, because soon after Britain left the European Union, COVID arrived. And so now all of these things are combining to make life quite difficult for ordinary Britons. And so they're queuing up against this very, very dark backdrop, which I think also lends an added poignancy to this moment, because this was a monarch who was there for a better part of a century. Wherever you stand uh, on the arguments for or against the monarchy, you cannot deny that she was there throughout a whole series of upheavals for this country. And she leaves at a time when it's facing really quite a serious upheaval uh, and really quite an uncertain future. 
Yeah, most certainly. I couldn't put it better myself, Nikhil. And I mean, what I would have uh, spoken about next is the fact that her having been there so long uh, has, uh, and now uh, having passed away, it's really a moment for the country to take stock of where the, um, they are at right now. Um, uh, and that also means looking at the balance sheet. Um, so uh, just taking a look here, uh, at that right now, the UK's royal family is funded mostly by the sovereign grant, which is funded by taxpayer money. Um, in the last seven years, uh, the monarchy spent more and more money. There was a big jump in that spending between 2018 and 2019 by almost 20 million uh, pounds. A major factor uh, for that rise was the cost of renovation work at Buckingham Palace. The electrical heating and plumbing, among other, other things, all needed replacement. Um, after the jump in 2018, the monarchy spent more each year after that, even in the pandemic years, when many Brits had to uh, curtail their spending. So uh, now taking a look at annual expenditure, we just talked about how uh, the royal purse grows in size each year. Um, of the little over 100 million pounds spent by the monarchy in 2021, the biggest funding came from the taxpayers' annual sovereign grant, and the deficit uh, was covered by the grant reserves. The size of the sovereign grant has also been steadily increasing in recent years. Um, and you may be wondering where all of this money is going. Um, a big chunk, uh, a big chunk of that money, over 62% of the expenditure was spent on property maintenance. Another big chunk was spent on wages for the 491 full-time working employees of the Crown. That amounts to 23.7 million pounds last year. And a budget of 4.5 million was spent on the royal travel, including Prince William and Kate's trip to the Caribbean, which was met with protests and um, also produced several f awkward photo ops. So um, all in all, it appears the monarchy um, spends a lot of money on public appearances is what we're getting out of that now. So, um, Birgit, another question for you. Is uh, this high cost uh, for the Crown a topic of discussion for Brits, or has this conversation changed at all uh, since the Queen's passed away? That is really interesting, because at the moment, I don't think it's really at the forefront for people. At the moment, like you're seeing with these queues, it's all about this national unity. I would say for most people, obviously not for everybody, because there are some people who always were Republicans and who really feel very strongly that the UK would be better off with an elected or appointed head, um, head of state, but not with somebody um, who is hereditary. And that there is, uh, you know, criticism also about her offspring, that people are saying they are mired and scandal, um, just uh, if you just think about uh, Prince Andrew. So, so there, are, there are people who are pointing that out, but I think at the moment it's not really where the country is at. Um, the reporting has been endless about the queue, about people who are really passing by and they want to pay their respects to the Queen and how this is a, a very sort of very friendly, very British, very orderly and very convivial affair. And I think this is really what, what's at the top of um, people's mind. However, we have to see what happens when Prince Charles actually in a way, does take over. He is obviously already the king, so sorry, he's King Charles, not Prince Charles anymore, but he, he hasn't really assumed his, his normal duties, and, and this is really the moment, I think, when it will be crucial. At the moment, we know that only roughly a good 20% would say abolish the monarchy, which is not nothing, and uh, support for the monarchy has fallen in the last decade. But the people who are sort of actively uh, driving the forces for, for, for the country to change and abolish the monarchy, they are definitely in the minority. But will they gain traction when the Queen, who has been so immensely popular, when she, you know, when the, in, in, in sort of weeks and months, I think, this is maybe when this topic will come up again. Right. I mean, of course, uh, as you're saying, we are seeing uh, huge amounts of support, even if right now we're talking about how costly uh, this funeral is, the crown um, is. And uh, there's, of course, an argument to be made as well that the crown um, is quite good for, for business in the UK. According to a brand and business valuation consultancy, uh, Brand Finance, the monarchy is, quote unquote, Britain's greatest treasure. Uh, the monarchy's brand value was worth an estimated 67.5 billion pounds in 2017. That's the last time an estimate was 
was done. Uh, the Crown contributes around £1.8 billion to the UK economy and costs each UK resident just £4.50 a year, according to that firm. Now, of course, the brand may have taken a bit of a hit since the last estimate came out. We know that Prince Harry and Meghan left for the U.S. We've also um, been hearing a lot about Prince Andrew's uh, sex scandal. Still, the family, the public, they're used to these scandals. And so I want to engage for a second with this idea of, of, of brand value, um, and I'd like to go to Nikhil on this. So this is a common argument trotted out in favor of the monarchy, that it's good for tourism, that it's good for the British brand. Um, in your opinion, do you think that this argument holds water, or is their contribution ultimately negligent i think you know i think it is as you say this is an argument that is very often made by the proponents uh of the monarchy and and you know people who argue that it should stay there it's one of the arguments made i should say i mean another argument that's made is that this way you have a head of state who is separate from politics and and everything that that entails but yes this argument that it is a draw for tourists it's a draw for people who come to britain go to london walk down the mall and you know stand outside buckingham palace and take selfies and so on and 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 that is no doubt i mean if you're in london if you're elsewhere in that country there's no doubt people do like that uh, the precise monetary value of these things you know it's it's always tricky how how they come up with these estimates but i think what is true and your colleague in london uh, touched on this is that now all of these things are really going to be in question. And I think they're going to be in question for a very, very specific reason to do with Queen Elizabeth II, which was the longevity of her reign. She, she was there for, as I said, a better part of a century. And so she wasn't simply, she wasn't simply somebody who was the face of this institution. She almost became bigger than the institution itself. Uh, you know, during, during the, the very dark days of COVID-19 pandemic soon after it arrived, she made a public address in Britain where among the things that she said to reassure people it was say that, you know, we will see our loved ones again. We will be able to live the lives uh, that we were living pre-pandemic. There, there was a very peculiar, very specific uh, credibility that attached to that image coming from her because she had been there through other people, right? She, she became monarch in the early 1950s, shortly after the end of the Second World War, a period during which the whole idea of patriotism uh, and being British and so on in that country assumed a whole new significance. And then she's been there ever since during all kinds of ups and downs. I mentioned earlier the pressures that the country is facing right now. They're not very different to the pressures that the country faced uh, back in the 1970s, high inflation and external energy shock. The Queen uh, was there. She was there throughout. If you walk down the street, uh, any sort of high street in that country, and you go to a post office and you buy stamps, the Queen's face is on those stamps. And for most Britons, it's always been there. The question, of course, now is what happens when there is somebody new who does not have, uh, put aside everything that, you know, the polls have said about whether a child is popular or not popular. The one thing that he just simply does not have, he doesn't have that sort of it's almost like the stardust, stardust of history that sort of the Queen had because she was part of history. There was I was in London when when her death was announced, and uh, a commentator on the BBC noted that many world leaders, and that Britain would use this almost uh, like a diplomatic carrot. Many world leaders wanted to be photographed with Queen Elizabeth, not necessarily because they wanted to be photographed with the British monarch, but because this monarch had been photographed with other major historical figures over the last century, Kennedy, right. Churchill, so on. And that by getting a picture taken with her, you were part of that story, right? That is no longer true. Well, we're, we're obviously uh, seeing a, uh, talking a lot about uh, positive associations with uh, Queen Elizabeth II, and uh, certainly still plenty of support today for the monarchy. But Birgit, on a technical level, uh, what would have to happen, actually, for the British monarchy to be abolished? And what might that mean for the royal family? We are really not at this point, as we've just said. So it's nothing that's really in the public sphere. I've, I've had a look. There is an organization that's called Republic, and they are collecting signatures for the abolition of the monarchy. And they are, um, you know, not even uh, at, at um, sort of 20,000 signatures. So it's really, um, it's really not, very, you know, people who are actively fighting for us, not a lot. It's thought that there will have to be a referendum. So the British public... It, it, 
you know, politicians who would consider abolishing the monarchy, they must think that they have the British public behind them. So the polls must turn in favor of a republic. Then it's thought that there should be a referendum to really make sure that this is what the British public wants. And then basically it would be up to parliament. Of course, there is a small chance of a revolution, but uh, it doesn't really look like it at the moment, at least. Right, yeah, and as you're saying, we should emphasize this is really um, uh, just a theoretical conversation, of course, support for the monarchy is so, uh, quite strong. Um, it, it's just a moment to reflect on the future of this institution, which is what we want to speak about in today's show. Um, now, uh, as part of the national remembrance and farewell to the Queen, the new Prime Minister Liz Truss, she also paid tribute to the monarch. Let's hear what she had to say. Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. Now, a flourishing country. Uh, thoughts on this, Bigot? I'd like to throw that question to you. Yes, I, I think Nihar has, has, has already alluded to it. Um, at least at the moment, Britain doesn't really look like a, a flourishing country. It's got productivity problems, which are historic, and they are also partly a result of the financial crisis. Um, we're seeing very slow growth, the slowest growth um, in the G7 is being, um, is being forecasted by the International Monetary Fund. And, and we have people here that are really dreading autumn and winter because people are being squeezed, the real wages have been falling, inflation is rising, and some people don't know whether they can heat whether they should heat their homes or feed their families. Heat or eat is the sort of a buzzword that, that's about it. And uh, of course the new prime minister is trying with a new package to support people, at least when it comes to energy costs, but the country is not exactly flourishing, as she said in this address. Yeah, heat and eat, that's quite a striking uh, phrasing. On that note, let's hear from people on the ground, um, hear what they themselves have to say about the situation. If it goes up, then I'll have to turn the heaters off and I won't have any heating. Um, I don't have running hot water because I can't afford to put the immersion on. I'm sort of making plans of which rooms we can heat at the moment. I mean, it might be a case of just wear, layering up and um, obviously having blankets around just to keep warm. We feel like a sinking abandoned ship. Um, there's nobody at the helm steering us in the, in the right direction. They're squabbling amongst themselves and they're not focusing on the true thing. And that's the voters and the people of this country. Now, Nikhil, you've uh, touched on this economic precarity in our talks today, also in your article uh, for GRID. Um, can you add anything to this uh, based on what we just heard? Well, you know, the, the, the a day or two after Queen Elizabeth died, uh, among the many things that happened in that country, it wasn't just the mourners that you saw on the street um, and, and, you know, the official statements and so on. You also had, uh, I think it was just the day after her death, you had three of the uh, major trade unions in the country call off or at least postpone for the moment strikes that were meant to take place. This was postal workers, transport workers, and they, they said that they would postpone their strike action until after the period of public mourning. Uh, and that just gave you, you know, it was just one example of what that country is living through right now. Because, of course, the strikes have been paused for now, but they will take place. And they will take place because of these pressures uh, to do with inflation, rising costs, and the pressure that that's putting on people's paychecks and wages and what they take home as the country heads to winter. So it's, it's a very problematic backdrop, a very uncertain backdrop. And this is one of those areas where these two things, you talked about what happens with the future of the monarchy. And as you say, we don't know um, for the moment what's going to happen with the future of the monarchy. We have, well, we're starting to get some sense, certainly outside Britain, right, with the, with the so-called Commonwealth realms where Charles is also now king. We've already heard noises about referendums taking place in those places, but certainly not in Britain for now. But, but the uncertainty that does attach to this transition as the crown passes to Charles uh, is mirrored by the uncertainty in the wider economy, because 
we mentioned the package, for instance, that, that Liz Truss announced to shield people from some of these energy price hikes. But, you know, nobody knows, none of us know, uh, given the uncertainty surrounding the war in Ukraine, what exactly is going to happen with gas prices on the international markets over the next several months. And so will that mean that Liz Truss's package is enough? Um, we don't know also what's going to happen with Britain and Brexit and, you know, what are increasingly, you know, testy talks with the European Union over certain, you know, certain provisions of, of the divorce deal that Britain had. So th there's all these, there's a, there's a whole list of uncertainties. And that's when the Queen, you know, as I said right at the beginning, left the state. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty grim. It's pretty dark in, in, in all of these senses, really. Certainly. Now, Nikhil, you mentioned the Commonwealth. And just to close us out, I did want to briefly talk about uh, this subject from a more global perspective. Um, and so, of course, uh, what we're talking about here is um, the UK. This death certainly has uh, rang out around the world, and that has to do with the UK's global influence um, and role, partly as a formal clo colonial power. That's one of the reasons why this is um, such a significant death. Uh, for the globe. Um, that role is still very much president, uh, present today, quite literally, in the form of the Commonwealth of Nations, which is an organization of sovereign states that recognize the British monarch as their figurehead. Uh, now, here's what Prime Minister Liz Truss, again, had to say about that relationship today. He championed the development of the Commonwealth from a small group of seven countries to a family of 56 nations spanning every continent of the world. We are now a modern, thriving, dynamic nation. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. Now, that was uh, Truss's perspective on the Commonwealth today. Now, as a reminder, the Commonwealth is uh, largely made up of former British colonies, and there is today a greater and greater push for the UK to come to term with its imperial past and the role that that past has played in economic disparity that we still, still see between nations today. Now, um, Birgit, can you tell us what are feelings from uh, the Commonwealth about the monarchy? Well, we've had mixed feelings, I think. There have been in some countries outpourings of grief, but then also we've had uh, other heads uh, of, of countries like, for example, Antigua and Barbuda say that there will be a referendum within three years and uh, to see whether the, the, the British monarch should still be the, the head of state. So it's really very, very mixed. And I think that reflects also the debate that we see here in the UK, where there has been really in the past years much a more emphasis on uh, the, the, the empire and uh, there has been a lot of criticism that, for example, in schools the empire wasn't discussed critically enough and statues were being toppled here. So it's been a really a big point of discussion and I think with the death of, que of the Queen this will gain traction so we will not see the end of the debates neither here in the UK nor in the Commonwealth. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, now, um, our correspondent spoke to some young Kenyans for their thoughts on her death. Let's have a listen to that briefly. I don't think the death of the Queen affects me because I am I'm, I'm pretty young and she, she's British, right? Uh, she's British and um, I'm Kenyan. She, it does not affect me that much. She balanced against all the turmoil that was going on in the world and birthed not only her nation into a new century, uh, but also African nations like ours. Well, uh, for the British to apologize, I feel apology is only a word. If you really want to apologize, there are so many stolen artifacts in the British Museum. Give it back to us. So uh, sort of mixed feelings there. Now, as Bigot mentioned, we know that uh, Barbados removed Queen Elizabeth II as its head of state last year, uh, though it does remain in the Commonwealth. Jamaica has said it plans to do the same. Now, Nikhil, just to close us out here, a bit of a forward-looking question. What, in your opinion, do you think is next for the British monarchy, either at home or abroad? Certainly, I think abroad, um, this, is, this is a big question for the British monarchy, because as you mentioned, you know, the Commonwealth of Nations, which is 56 countries, uh, within that there is this group of 14, the so-called Commonwealth realms, uh, which is where Charles uh, is now king. And, and so I'm not sure, even New Zealand, New Zealand, the prime minister earlier this week, she said that 
going to a referendum on this question isn't on her government's immediate agenda. But she also said that she expects that within her lifetime, certainly, New Zealand will become a republic. So even in places where you won't see an immediate vote on this question, I, I'm not sure that this, 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 this Commonwealth realm idea, which... Britain, I have to say, talks about much more. You, you had the Prime Minister's, Liz Truss's um, statement there. Uh, you know, the word Commonwealth comes up a lot more in London than it does abroad, uh, because arguably the wealth wasn't all that common. It went, it was transferred to the colonial power, which was Britain. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a big question mark there. And, it, it, you know, I find it hard to see how, you know, it won't... Uh, you know, the influence of the British crown in these places won't be eroded, uh, if not completely extinguished over the years. As for the monarchy at home, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, a lot of it will no doubt turn on how Charles uh, behaves as king. He has a history of speaking out on certain issues, um, certainly to do with the environment, for instance, over the years. Uh, the Queen, one of the things that really uh, made people respect her quite a lot was the fact that she was just a quiet presence. She didn't really you know, intervene at all in any kind of sort of public debate. Is Charles going to do that? Are there going to be more controversies? Um, and also, you know, these polls, I should just add uh, to finish off, the polls that we have mentioned, which talk about support for the monarchy, most of them, uh, almost all of them, I think, uh, took place when Queen Elizabeth was on the throne. So, so we'll have to see what happens over the next few weeks, months, and indeed years with Charles as king, and whether now, when you are asked that question, when the picture on your banknote or your stamp is not, you know, the silhouette of Queen Elizabeth II, but of King Charles III, are you going to feel the same uh, even in the UK? I, you know, I don't know. But but those are the things we're going to have to watch over the next over the next few, as I said, weeks, months, and years uh, right. as as Charles settles into the throne. Right, right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, as a quick footnote, that Liz Truss, Truss quote uh, from before was from last week, not today. Apologize uh, for my mistake there. Um, now, I want to thank both of my guests for joining me for the DW Business Special, looking at the economic costs and benefits of the British monarchy. Thank you to Nikhil Kumar, Deputy Global Editor at GRID, uh, who joined us from New York and my colleague Bigot Moss, DW's correspondent in London. Uh, now, for our viewers, I would encourage you to check out more videos here on YouTube, including our Business Beyond series, which takes a deeper dive at topics shaping the global economy today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you next time.